We all live in the digital world. We all need it to be open and safe. We all want to trust. And to be trusted. We all despise control. And desire freedom. We, we are all united. united. And we are right on time. And we are good to go, I believe. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you might be. Welcome to the first day of the hybrid IGF. I am pleased to welcome you to a session where we are looking forward to discussing the future of Internet, of global Internet governance. This is a session that is co-hosted by the Polish Foreign Ministry together with the University of Lodz, which I have the pleasure of representing. My name is Jana Kulesha. I work at the University of Lodz, where I research and teach international law and internet governance. And it is my pleasure today to moderate a session where I am joined by representatives of various sectors of research, of um, the technical community, of uh, local uh, economic enterprises around the globe to discuss the future of global internet governance. Please let me start with a brief round of introductions. And after that, we will dive right into the discussion where I will ask our panelists to share their perspectives on a few specific questions we have posed in the agenda and we are looking to collect the answers for. This is just a 60 minute session, so I will, without any further ado, briefly introduce our panelists, recall the questions that we've agreed to discuss and ask them to share their insights. Our first speaker today will be Mr. Alain Durand, who's the principal technologist for the Internet Corporation for Assigned Names and Numbers. We will start off today with discussing the future of Internet governance by looking at a proposal from a Chinese company, Huawei, that focused on what they refer to as a new IP. ICANN is in the business of managing core internet resources, including the domain name system, internet names and numbers. So when a new IP proposal comes onto the scene, our first speaker has been eagerly interested and he has kindly agreed to share his insights as reiterated in a report on new IP to give us a perspective on the technical aspect of that proposal. Is there a need for a new IP? Is there a reason for it to be introduced? We will ask Alain to give us his thoughts on this specific proposal, but as I am certain he will also highlight about similar proposals that are also coming onto the scene. We will seek to explore whether the contemporary model of internet governance is legitimate or whether we might look into the alternatives. To help us answer this question, I am thrilled to welcome today also Mandy Carver, as supporting the internet corporations for assigned names and numbers in her role as the senior vice president for government and intergovernmental organizations engagement. Mandy is um, on uh, the pursuit of ensuring that global policies around the DNS names and numbers are intact with the technical model of governance that ICANN so effectively supports. So I will 
very much be eager to learn from Mandy, whether the new IP proposal and similar prospects around the world reflect the multi-stakeholder model that ICANN has been supporting or whether there is something that we should keep in mind when such proposals are being discussed. And then we would like to hear from members of business and academia from different regions of the world. We will start with Professor Xupi Xi, who is a professor at the Global Internet Governance Studies Center at the Communications University of China, where he also manages the operations of the Global Internet Governance Studies Center. He's a seasoned academic in uh, internet governance, international relations. He uh, disposes of in-depth knowledge of the new IP proposal, but also of the multi-stakeholder model that the IGF has been supporting over the years. So we will start off with Professor Su looking very much forward to his insights on how the new IP proposal reflects onto the current multi-stakeholder model and international relations, including economic relations. Then we will kindly request the opinion on these issues from Abdul Hakim Ajijola, who among different hats, including, for example, supporting the Global Commission on the Stability of Cyberspace as a commissioner, is experienced in Nigerian and African international relations, including economic relations and their impact on cybersecurity, where he has had the opportunity to chair the Nigerian National Cybersecurity Policy and Strategy Committee. And then last, by, by no means least, Professor Wolfgang Kleinwechter, now a professor emeritus at the Aarhus University, but a leading international internet governance scholar, a pioneer, a member of the working group on internet governance and a long time ICANN director. I could imagine no better suited European perspective presented than the one by Professor Klein lecture today. I think that uses up my five minutes for the introductions. I am very much looking forward to Alain giving us a brief technical introduction into the new IP proposal. What does it hold? How does it support the multi-stakeholder model as we know it? Is there anything we should particularly keep in mind when discussing it? And is there a need to see proposals like the new IP enter the stage. Um, without further ado, Alain, I would love for you to take the floor. Thank you again for joining us today. Thank you, Joanna, for having me today. And I appreciate the opportunity to have this conversation with a larger community. Uh, I would like to start by saying that IP is not an old 40 year old protocol of the static and rusty. This is something that has been evolving over time. And there were things that were thought impossible only 10, 20, 30 years ago, like multimedia, like video conferences. And look at what we are doing here in this hybrid meeting. We are talking over IP. We are having these video conferences and millions and millions of people every single day are using this infrastructure in COVID times. It's quite remarkable. Are those things that were deemed impossible of actually today, the bread and butter of this industry and everybody in the planet. So proposal to evolve IP, they have been existing for quite a while. Um, every five, 10 years, there are some new ideas that are coming from. And um, they're usually coming from the academic community. Uh, there are numbers that we can mention. For example, uh, there was a Gini effort a number of years ago in the US. There was a Rina effort from John Day, one of the pioneer of the internet in the 70s. Uh, there have been a proposal called non-IP that came at Etsy and, and, and many others. Um, new IP is, this, is one of such proposal. It's not a standard, it's not even a draft standard. There are actually no published documentation about the protocol. So it's impossible for today, somebody to go and implement this thing. Um, there might be some implementation in the lab that have never been exposed and been shown, but the road from a lab experiment into something that can be deployed across the entire internet is a very long one. And we have an example of that. Um, today, the internet works mostly on protocol non-IP version four. 
in the early 90s, 1991, 1992, I started to work with many others on a new version of this called IP version six. And here we are 30 years later and it's still not deployed across the world. IP version four to IP version six was a minor departure. Here we're talking about a major departure from IP. So we'll have to contemplate at least as long of a transition from one to the other. There's something to really keep in mind. Now about the technical aspect of a, a new IP. One thing that really is, struck me when I was looking at this, trying to analyze the various bits and pieces I could find, is that it put a greater burden on all the intermediary routers on the internet. You need to remember one thing, the internet was built on a paradigm called the datagram paradigm. And in this a router task is to simply dynamically discover all the topology around him, like all the other routers on all different links, and forward packet to the next hop, to the hop that is closer to the final destination. And that's essentially it, not much else. This is a key design property of the internet. And this has enabled what we call permissionless innovation. Where if you want to deploy something new, you just deploy it at the edges. Don't need to request permission to all the service providers, all the routers in the world to go and implement something. That's how in the mid nineties, we could deploy the web so quick. That's how in, in 2000 things like Facebook or Google or uh, any of the other platform that we know and use today, even Zoom as we are using to, right now, could be deployed without having to ask for the authorization of anybody, permissionless innovation. And that's a major problem. So asking routers to do more is essentially a step backward to the telephony model. And um, we can only fear that it will slow down innovation. If we remember the innovation rate during the telephony days were not exactly the same as what we see on the internet. Now, um, another point that is introduced by my new IP is the idea of um, strict quality of service features on a per flow basis. This is actually not new. It was proposed more than 20 years ago in the technology on the internet that's called InterServ for integrated services. And it had very, very little deployment for a number of reasons. Um, the first one is that when you reserve bandwidth for specific application, you take away bandwidth from the common pool. And bandwidth is expensive and resources associated with it are also expenses, expensive. So uh, when you're doing this, especially in a multi-operator environment, it requires very strong collaboration between those operators. And uh, this is something really complex to do. Complex and expensive don't work well on the internet. Things that are cheap and easy actually work much better. So if you want to do this in a, in a dynamically way, dynamic way, sorry, as proposed in new IP, what you need to do is have every single router do some extra work to go and authenticate every single flow, if only to be able to charge the money associated with reservation of those resources to that particular user. Uh, doing this will require that routers will have a key of a cryptographic session used by every single router. And that introduced in the architecture of the internet, control points, control choke points. And those points, control points will have some severe implication on privacy, of course, but also could be used for uh, large scale surveillance and population control. Those are concerns that I have, that we have when reading the various documents related to new IP, remembering that this is not a protocol that is published. We cannot really look at all the various details because they're simply not available. So I don't want to use too much of my time and I would like to hand the floor back to Joanna. Thank you. Thank you very much, Alain. That was a brief yet a very clear the iteration of the new IP as not yet being a technical proposal, one that is tangible, but at the same time of it holding a certain threat to the per, per, permissionless innovation upon which the internet has been built. Therefore, there seemed to be a certain challenge with A, understanding and B, possibly implementing 
the new YP or similar proposals. We don't want to focus on this one too much. You do have papers on similar proposals that are popping up around the world, trying to change the paradigm of multi-stakeholder governance as we have known it. So this is the technical perspective. Any new proposal on how to manage key internet resources might prove challenging to innovation and the internet as we know it. And with that, I'm happy to turn the floor to Mandy, who focuses on the multi-stakeholder governance model with regard to intergovernmental um, um, relations and how such proposals might impact the consensus we have built as the international community around governance on what internet critical resources are. Mandy, if you would like to share your thoughts, again, not just on the new IP, but on similar proposals popping up, that would be wonderful. Again, thank you for joining us today. Thank you, Joanna. Um, as, as Joanna said, my name is Mandy Carver. I am the Senior Vice President for Government and IGO Engagement at ICANN. I want to follow on my colleague Alain Durand's technical comments about new IP, but as Joanna has said about the proposal of, of any new protocols to address some concerns raised from a governance or policy implication side of what an operational or implementation of a new protocol might bring. And my focus as is the focus of everyone at ICANN is on a single globally interoperable internet. For those of you who don't know ICANN, uh, the Internet Corporation for Signs and Names and Numbers, our mission is to ensure the stable and secure operation of the, the Internet's unique identifier systems. So we coordinate the allocation and assignment of names in the root zone of the domain name system. We facilitate the coordination and operation and evolution of the root zone name server system. We coordinate the allocation and assignment of the topmost level of internet protocol numbers, the autonomous system numbers, collaborate with other bodies as appropriate to provide registries needed for the functioning of the internet as specified by the internet protocol standards, development organizations, and um, that's really the first pillar, that's the technical core of our work. There's a second pillar, which is a policy development process that uses a multi-stakeholder model to develop policies and procedures related to the coordination and administration of the unique identifiers. And it's through that multi-stakeholder model that governments, through something called the Government Advisory Committee or the GAC at ICANN, as well as the technical community and industry can all work together. So we are a, an open global organization um, and a, uh, a dialogue and, and uh, consensus building multi-stakeholder model. As I said, ICANN's core mandate is to ensure the stability, security, and resilience of the DNS that allows tens of thousands of networks across the globe to be one global internet connected internet. And so it's fundamental to this mandate that we be aware that there are risks of internet fragmentation by changing protocols and that that risk is real because it's the integration of the internet, it's the decision by everyone to use a common domain namespace, a common IP addressing system, and to adhere to the same protocol specifications that has been the biggest factor enabling the success of the global internet over the last 30 years. And that's the primary concern with the discussion of the new internet protocol or any of the other uh, discussions that have been brought up with potential new protocols, because changing core protocols of the internet pose a much greater potential risk to interoperability than the development of a new product or an application that is compatible with the existing protocol. A new core raises questions about the trust and use of the existing protocol if you don't have a consensus over what that new protocol is and what questions it's trying to answer. So, we would ask, and Alan has already flagged that it's very hard to find any materials about, um, or any well-developed materials about some of the new proposed protocols. What is the problem that the new protocol seeks to solve? What are the ideas or services anticipated that could not be developed using uh, and implemented using existing protocols? And 
through that, then it's important to identify what do we currently have? Is new IP, as it's referred to, or any of the other dialogues and proposals, are they actually a protocol? Or are they a proposed research project or a series of research projects? Um, is this ready to be implemented or isn't it? There's a quite a bit of confusion out there when we talk to representatives of governments or, or members of the technical community, because the language used in various proposals in different meetings have very much confused the discussions. Uh, the global community needs to understand what they would be trading away versus what they hope to gain with any change in protocol. So again, what are the problems they seek to solve and what do they risk breaking in the process of that new implementation? As Alan has mentioned, the transition from IPv4 to Internet Protocol 6 has been underway, under discussion, implementation for 30 years, and it's still not completed. And that wasn't a change in the fundamental protocol. So at a time when we're all focused on trying to bring the next billion users online, when there is growing concern and dialogue about a digital divide or the potential that some countries or economies are at risk of being left behind, is that the time to change the core protocol? Do you choose the moment when you're trying to bring the next billion online to actually increase the complexity of access and slow innovation? When manufacturers produce incompatible products, then the consumers are constrained in their choices and the future uh, applications extensibility of, of those products. If the discussions of the potential product changes are necessary to address the potential, so I'm sorry, discussions of those potential product changes are necessary to address the potential new services that would be facilitated by new IP. All of these things bring heavy trade-offs. As has already been said, the existing internet or network of networks relies on a simple core, allowing the complexity, if it's needed, to reside at the edges. That allows permissionless innovation, as Alain has said. If a new internet protocol creates more burdens on intermediary routers in order to provide proposed benefits, then it'll potentially require a more centralized design compatibility that, as Alain has already mentioned, was used in the telephony model. And this creates constraints on innovation because you can't just add things at the edges, you've got to reverse engineer back to the, to the core. In addition, by requiring the intermediary routers to perform more tasks, you increase the potential for failure, you introduce potential brittleness in the design, you introduce potential choke points. Alan has mentioned the cryptography needed that uh, in order for the routers to work as far as we can understand by the materials that are available. And that would create the possibility, the potential impact on privacy, potential surveillance. All of these risks would be in the core so that if something breaks, the harm is much more widespread than if you have small failures at the edges. Um, the, an example would be the kinds of switching failures that took place under the telephony models in the past. So there, as Alain has mentioned, there are similar examples of protocols that have similar aspects, the in-serve model because of the quality of service requirements. They've already demonstrated that the costs um, are high and that creates poor scalability if you have a multi-operator environment. And when you're discussing core internet protocols, you're not talking about changes for a single country or a single market. You're talking about a global model. So a change at the core would require a global change. So similarly, if there are sectors of the internet that reject the harmony of the internet's unique identifier system, internet end users would be constrained in sites they could visit and applications they could use. So creation of a new protocol without a clear consensus in the technical community erodes confidence and trust in the existing protocol. Um, ICANN believes, and government engagement 
within ICANN believe that our role is to have technical conversations with governments to continue talking to them. And we do meetings, briefings, we publish papers, government engagement does, as does Alain's uh, department, OCTO. And I encourage you all, if you haven't seen them, to go to the ICANN website and to look at those papers because they are very helpful in understanding where the discussions are taking place and the potential impact of, of some of the discussions in those forums. We want to continue an informational outreach effort so that if governments are discussing these issues in other fora, they know that about ICANN's role, they know that they have a role within the multi-stakeholder model, that they can participate in the government advisory committee and what it does and what ICANN does. So my team is involved in an analysis of potential impacts of governmental actions on the technical functions of the internet. And we are engaging with governments and IGOs on those potential impacts. As I've said before, we want to understand the issues and challenges the governments seek to address and to assist them through the sharing of information to avoid unintended consequences of impacting the infrastructure of the internet. Any changes to the core protocol should only be undertaken with a very clear problem description, a defined framework, an extensive and transparent study, debate, and consensus of the possibilities versus the trade-offs of a change in the protocol. And I'll stop there. Thank you, Joanna. Thank you, Marita. That's a very clear message. Wonderful for us to start with. Again, just to highlight, this is not just about the new IP, but I am thrilled that uh, Professor Xu has kindly agreed to share his insights, his insider perspective on why this proposal would be put on the table. We will use it as a point of departure for a larger discussion around keeping the internet one internally uh, as it is at this point. So this is a very strong technical perspective on keeping the multi-stakeholder model as it is, including governmental engagement through the GAC within ICANN, for example. But I would love to give the floor to my fellow academics for their regional perspectives, as well as to thank you very much for joining us, Abdul Hakim, for the business perspective in a very vital area where the next billion resides, which would be the largely broadly understood African region. Professor Ksu, thank you very much for joining us. I'm curious if you would like to share your thoughts on this example of advancing the multi-stakeholder model that we have taken the new IP to be for this discussion, but to more broadly discuss the potential that the multi-stakeholder model holds and the potential challenges that we might want to resolve. With this in mind, I'm going to encourage our participants, I see we're enjoying quite a few of our colleagues joining us here, to make a best use, best use of the chat. So we only have 60 minutes, there will really not be much room for Q&A, but I do encourage our participants to put their comments or questions in the chat. This is just the start of a discussion. Professor Xu, the floor is yours again. Thank you so much for joining us. Well, thank you, Johanna, uh, for inviting me to present a Chinese perspective uh, about this very important topic. And I'm uh, very glad that uh, Alan and uh, Mandy uh, representing ICANN has talked about uh, uh, the uh, new IP proposal from a technical perspective. I think the reports written by ICANN uh, has been also very widely distributed among the Chinese uh, ICANN community. And our ICANN representative uh, based in Beijing is also in the room, by the way. Uh, I'm uh, talking from a rather non-technical perspective about my understanding about the new IP proposal, which is rather original, by the way. Uh, so I will somehow answer your questions uh, listed on the website one by one. There are three. The first one is about this core concept that is called one internet and one word, or one word and one internet you're asking whether it is outdated. And uh, uh, from the Chinese perspective and my own perspective, that this is not only not outdated, but is the most needed and urgently needed. And uh, that my, uh, my observation about the Chinese perspective about how the new IP proposal was interpreted by the media 
and by the politicians, especially, I'm not talking about technical community, is actually a, a wake up call uh, that uh, not about Huawei is splitting the internet, it's about others are splitting the internet, which uh, is actually uh, against the thought of uh, various stakeholders in China. And uh, we all know that China is the somehow the uh, second largest digital economy, and uh, it is uh, totally valued at uh, somehow uh, the statistic uh, is six trillion USD in terms of digital economy in 2022. And China is, by the way, the most dependent country on digital economy, and the exact percent of uh, GDP is uh, 39 percent. Uh, so it's uh, completely against the Chinese interests, uh, all the stakeholders' interests to, to split the internet. So it's somehow, in my idea, it's impossible for, uh, for the Chinese businesses and for the Chinese authorities and for the Chinese uh, civil society actors to propose anything that would split the internet. And uh, however, the, the debate, the political debate around the new IP proposal of the, accus the accusation of Huawei of splitting the internet serves actually as a wake up call uh, that uh, people may use, may use this kind of excuse uh, to actually do uh, the splitting uh, by themselves. So that is a somehow a very uh, digital economic background about uh, how the uh, different stakeholders feel about uh, how the new IP was, was debated by the media, like Financial Times and, uh, and uh, by the political uh, forces. So I'm very glad that uh, Ireland has produced uh, a kind of icon uh, perspective or the report from the uh, representing the technical community. And secondly, uh, you have raised the question about uh, for example, uh, the, the new IP proposal as a departure of a thought in thinking about fragmentation. And in my opinion, what is really at issue in the global, the global debate about Huawei's new IP proposal is somehow about, uh, about uh, a trend that uh, uh, political actors or national security narratives are gaining momentum in the debate about the internet governance. So there is a kind of invasion of the, the national security narrative in the debate about this internet core resources. Uh, that's something that we should uh, uh, be alarmed for. And uh, of course, this is somehow like a blind man and the elephant story that everybody has their own perspective about it. Uh, uh, somehow, I personally started from a media expert, by the way. <laughs> so I tend to uh, somehow, at the very beginning, interpreted this as a kind of a misinformation or misreading by the media, uh, like uh, Financial Times wrote in a very uh, funny but familiar way in my kind of uh, uh, study about the media. So Financial Times was uh, writing, quote, on a cold day, Late last September, half a dozen Chinese engineers walked into a conference room in the heart of Geneva's UN district with a radical idea. <laughs> so this kind of uh, media narratives about something, uh, I, I think, is not contributing to the discussion. It's somehow trying to exaggerate in, uh, the situation. And Alan has pointed out that it's not a standard. It is actually a white book. Uh, if it is good, so take it. If it is not good, drop it. So simple like that. So it, ha it had been debated already by the technical community at ITU and also some others uh, for quite a couple of years. But it uh, was, was uh, given political attention after the Financial Times story, which is not helpful, by the way. And by the way, this is about the future, but how about the past? The Huawei, the company, its cheap supply was cut off. Nobody paid attention to it. And also, by the way, its Android system was cut off. Now it had to develop a kind of a harmony system. So my Huawei mobile phone is, is now, I have to restart it in a different way because the Android 
system architecture was no longer useful. So all those things that took place in the past, the media didn't pay attention to it. So they, they would like to pay attention to a kind of a wild thinking about what, what might happen in the future. But that is the future. Everybody has the right to think about the future. I think Huawei is meant to actually contribute to the discussions. And, but it turned out uh, that it is uh, somehow misunderstood by the, the media. So I think beyond the technical community, the discussion about the uh, new IP was not that helpful and it didn't contribute a lot uh, to the discussions. And then you raised the third question that is about, uh, should we distribute the authority to manage the call of the internet among national governments? I think the answer is uh, no. And the chi Chinese government and all the stakeholders have repeatedly expressed its support of ICANN, uh, for example, about the INA transition. So it is repeated from the bottom to the top, but those voices were not heard by the way. So China, actually the stakeholders support one world, one internet, and also the one internet coordinated by ICANN. So, but those voices are uh, somehow put aside. So if there is one lesson that we learned from discussion, especially the political and media discussion about the new IP story is that, uh, okay, it might be the political actors who accuse Huawei's new IP uh, proposal. Uh, they might have the intention to split the internet. So that might be the lesson uh, that uh, uh, somehow I have observed. But the truth, I think, will be out uh, uh, very soon that uh, this, if this might be used as a cue to take political actions. And I can, and the technical communities, and academic and the civil society actors should pay attention to all the governments and all the political actors and all the, their political actions in the field of the internet uh, instead of one government and so on and so forth. Solution? I think the Global Commission, I think quite a, a several people were involved in the Global Commission. They had a proposal about the uh, public call of the internet. So I think if, if we accept that as a norm and if that norm can be translated into international law, that would be very helpful, for example, to defend uh, the, the core resources uh, of the internet from being intervened by governments and authorities. Thank you, Joanna. Great, thank you very much. That is music to my ears as an international lawyer and as a moderator, I'm glad to see that we are all on the same page. One world, one internet remains the chime for internet governance. Uh, and since the Global Commission has been mentioned, I will hand the floor over to two other commissioners, starting with Abdul Hakim. Let me just note that I'm certain that um, international lawyers uh, uh, and I can as well are following the processes within the UN when there are debates around conventions, keeping the internet safe that are led by specific governments. So deep, uh, deep strong positions to keep the internet governance mechanism as it is in place, keeping the key resources safe is much welcome. Thank you very much for that contribution. And I hand the floor swiftly off to uh, Abdul Hakim. We're looking for regional perspectives. Uh, um, Pixie mentioned the element of supply chain security, how we want to keep the devices interoperational, whereas at the same time, key global resources might need to stay at the trustworthy hands of the global multi-stakeholder community. There's also a question that refers to that region in the chat, should you wish to look into that, Abdul Hakim. Again, we are short on time, that discussion probably needs more space, but if you would just like to make your key points, that would be much appreciated. Thank you again for joining us and for bearing with the technical issues here. Thank you very much, Joanna. First of all, you know, my understanding is that Huawei has a study initiative that is looking into next generation network and protocol systems for the digital network industry and society. Uh, from my reading, uh, Huawei itself indicates that its work is actually not currently, quote unquote, not currently relevant to the governance model discussions. Uh, so, you know, in, instead the new IP study is uh, to study the technologies that fulfill the need for increased flexibility, determinism, uh, security and privacy and so on. 
And so basically, I think they're trying to work towards <clears throat> uh, what might or might not be required uh, in the future. However, um, from my <clears throat> perspective in Africa, it, it is clear that this, uh, com these conversations are compounded by different philosophies, ethics, and principles of the various protagonists. Uh, and, and, and unfortunately, there are some consequent negative impacts on trust. However, <clears throat> that said, we must be wary of potential fragmentation of technologies as we've seen manifest in one, separate initiatives by Russia and Iran to create independent network infrastructure uh, with separate domain na name systems and related architecture. Uh, two, uh, we've seen geopolitical tensions which um, are exacerbated by what Harvard professor Emeritus Joseph Nye uh, describes as the weaponization of interdependence. Uh, we saw this with uh, the efforts by the previous Trump administration to sanction and coerce other nations into banning, uh, raising tariffs or domestic ownership, um, domesticating ownership of foreign technology providers and products. Uh, again, uh, 5G infrastructure, uh, is a very classic case in point and apps like TikTok. We've also seen India in 2020 banning 118, 118 Chinese apps ostensibly for national security re uh, reasons. So retaliation to such sanctions can motivate the development of alternative, often incompatible models, standards and pathways. So this is very real in terms of the threat. Um, there are initiatives, in, including uh, across Africa, to impose digital um, taxes. And, you know, we're seeing the collapse of established data protection agreements and technology sovereignty rearing its head with, uh, you know, a number of initiatives across the world aimed at reining in the power of global technology giants, which in of itself is not a bad thing. Uh, but, you know, we do need to foster indigenous alternatives um, you know, else we will only exacerbate some of our difficulties. So the concerns here for some of us are that one, how does this impact the public core of the internet? And I think um, we've heard some very good interventions on this. Um, two, does it help or hurt IPV uh, adoption? And three, uh, you know, what is the policy impact on global internet governance, if any? Uh, unfortunately, from the African perspective in particular, uh, our challenges are deepened by the misperception that things like internet governance are not really African problems to solve. This is compounded by a lack of awareness, uh, inconsistent approach, and certainly little consensus on cyber norms, I I indeed, based on lack of understanding. So how do we move forward, <clears throat> especially the global South and Africa? First of all, uh, the Global South and African nations in particular, our member states must understand that we do risk being caught, caught out as unwary victims of potential China, USA, USA, Europe, USA, Russia, and or China, India, geopolitical and cyber warfare battle space. And this also <clears throat> flows into the internet governance space. So to this end, <clears throat> we must uh, understand that contemporary geopolitics impacts technology interests and new tools like online fake news and hate speech are being weaponized. Memetic warfare re resulting in the spreading of weaponized ideas for influence and control is, is happening. And it's now a very well established tool for state and non-state actors to exploit. For the global South <clears throat> to begin to sustainably address these and related challenges, uh, we must ourselves define and protect the global south's interest in all spheres and domains plus articulate our own internet governance uh, and related technology philosophies ethics principles policies and strategies arguably it is the underlying philosophies that are at the heart of internet governance misunderstandings and in particular this new ip discussion and africa in particular needs to develop uh, its own uh, you know philosophies and ethics and principles to guide us through our own options. Uh, we also must understand that the Global South must moderate and adapt to the realities of a multipolar world of technology by one, building proficiency in monitoring and proactively navigating complex and varied economic, commercial, technology, privacy and connectivity relationships as they relate to cyberspace. Two, we must mobilize or motivate the Global South to research, develop and innovate by understanding and employing indigenous technologies and solutions to minimize 
our total dependencies on uh, you know, a, a single external parties. Uh, we must not be vendor driven. Uh, we must also develop and implement robust vetting mechanisms when interrogating hardware, software, or networking solutions and segment operations across multiple pathways, organizations, and technologies to minimize single uh, you know, points of failure. So the bottom line here is that the global South must develop its indigenous capacities based on teaching, learning, research, and innovation. And I think the question uh, about Afrinic is very important here. For many of us in Africa, we see it as an extension of the, the exploitation of African resources. Africa receives um, about 5% of the global IP addresses. A single company in Hong Kong basically surreptitiously acquired 3% of our total IP resources and was <clears throat> selling them to allegedly to you know, gambling sites and pornographic sites and basically ex um, extracting a very high profit without any commensurate return to Africa. And when challenged on this, uh, they, 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 they were able to get Afrinix assets frozen. Not only did this um, cause the potential for a failure of the Africa internet space, but actually um, was a single potential single point of failure for the global uh, internet management space. So I think there are lessons for us to draw here on how, um, and, and one is very grateful that the other uh, RIIs actually did come to the rescue of Afrinix during this uh, trying period, and we're very grateful for that. But the point is that we do need to learn, learn the lessons. We do need to make the improvements. We do need to make sure that we do not have these single points of fa organizational failure, and we do need to move forward. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Abdul Hakim. That was wonderful. You've managed to combine all of the layers of the internet. Some say that there is no more uh, lasagna, it's all a spaghetti. And I think that you've made that very clear in your intervention where we look at the IP numbers, we look at RIRs, but we look at platforms, TikToks and GDPR as well. Um, I warmly welcome your emphasis on capacity building and understanding the complexity of the issue. Something that in Central and Eastern Europe we have struggled with as well. There are programs that are dedicated to capacity building. Europe wishes to be a leader in international internet governance paradigms and norms, whereas it in itself is quite diverse. And with that wonderful introduction, I hand the floor over to Professor Kleinwetter, what is the European perspective on all the things we just discussed, starting with splinternet scenarios, which the new IP, as uh, Bexi clearly emphasized, is not? What is the European perspective on the new paradigms for multi-stakeholder governance? Um, Professor Kleinwechsel, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much. And first of all, Joanna, thank you for organizing this. So it was organized in the last minute, but it's a very needed discussion. And as Abdul Hakem just said, you know, uh, we need the discussion, we need the improvement because it is as Bill Clinton has said in an ICANN meeting 10 years ago, uh, the whole discussion is stumbling forward. So we are moving into a new territory and we have to find out, you know, what is the best next step? So it's not big jumps, it's next step there. We are exploring, you know, what is be useful for meanwhile, 5 billion people in the world. So, and one of the beauty of the system is, uh, of the internet is it's a layered system. And uh, so it was uh, the designers of the original protocols, which kept the internet or presented the internet as an open network. So you could add, as uh, uh, several speakers have said, you know, without any big permission, new applications, new services. So the openness and the interoperability are key features. And in so far, it's an evolving process. I think Alain has made this very clear in his opening. So uh, since 50 years, we see a process where we add new layers and new protocols. So we have now more than 8,000 or 9,000 already RFCs in the Internet Engineering Task Force. And new RFCs, that means new protocols, new standards will come. So this is a process which is open and will lead us, fortunately, uh, or hopefully, uh, into a, a, a better future. But we see a lot of, uh, let's say, other problems which are around it. I see with the new IP process, 
Uh, for me, these are two, two, two interlinked uh, problems. One is a substantial problem, and the other one is a procedural problem. So the substantial problem, what I see is that um, certainly, you know, the founding fathers of the internet, uh, you know, had, uh, were driven uh, by the idea to enable communication. So there was not security first. So, and there was also not, you know, uh, uh, speed first. So it was just to enable communication. And uh, if you look into the, the internet as we have today, so there are certainly, you know, some weaknesses uh, which has to be uh, uh, improved. And so one of the weaknesses are uh, security and the other one is uh, latency. We have for some applications which will be beyond the horizon, 5G applications, you know, autonomous cars and, you know, uh, 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 surgeries or whatsoever. So you cannot work with uh, a latency which is, uh, you know, uh, could be dangerous uh, for life and death questions. So, and, uh, and, and also, you know, uh, you, you have to have a higher standard of security. What I've seen in this um, uh, discussion, and, and so far, I think the, the paper, uh, uh, which was di distributed in the uh, focus group of the ITU, you know, uh, raises some issues, which has to be discussed. So how to do that? So I remember a discussion 10 or 15 years ago, also in the IGF, when France came with the idea, uh, we need a new protocol for the Internet of Things. They called it the ONS, the Object uh, Naming or Numbering System, uh, and said, you know, this, is, this will be next to the DNS. So the idea was also to create something like an alternative or a substitute to say we have the Internet for persons or for people, which is based on the DNS, and then we build something for objects. So it was a special idea of France, and it was in the IGF in Nairobi, where we discussed and said, okay, wait a minute, what is really the Internet of Things? That is an application on top of the DNS. So that means if you want to promote the Internet of Things, there is no need, you know, to build a new network, you know, uh, ignoring the existing protocols. It's just an application on top of this. As uh, uh, you know, although it was said already, you know, a lot of these new applications, search engines, you know, social networks are services application on top of the protocol. So, and, and, and the beauty of the system is that uh, this is an open protocol. So you can add an endless chain of new services and application. And then, you know, within this new application, you can add uh, some specific protocols, how to manage, within this uh, special application, certain rules. Facebook has its own rules, you know, Google has its own rules. So that means if you are looking for applications for autonomous cars or for, uh, 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 you know, online surgeries or something like that. So then you can, uh, let's say, manage issues like latency and security within this special network. So that means the way forward is not to change the whole system, to have uh, uh, to, to remove the TCP IP protocol and to introduce an, a new IP protocol, but you know on the edges, you know allow a, a greater flexibility uh, so that new applications and services which are enabled by the existing protocols, because protocols are also enablers, so they enable innovation or uh, without permission. So did you allow, you know, then the emergence of certain uh, uh, bubbles, networks or whatever. Uh, uh, so that, and, and then you can settle the, the real problems as security and latency uh, in a way, you know, within this network. And then, uh, uh, it, but if you try to change the whole system, then this exactly happened what Mandy has said. You know, this creates confusion this politicize a neutral technical resource and leads us to nowhere. And, 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 and the outcome will be uh, a battle that, that, that you have immediately two camps, you know, uh, which uh, really uh, choose the way backwards and not the way forward. So I, when Clinton said, you know, that's stumbling forward, he said, it has to be forward, and not to, to, to go in circles around or backwards. So that means we have to move into this new territory. And in so far, this um, uh, um, 
taking some arguments seriously and uh, then to have an open debate. So what I have seen now also in, in some Chinese papers, and I had a discussion also with uh, Pike C already on this, is that um, in the IEEE or some other organizations, you have now papers on so-called polymorphic networks. So that means you have uh, on, on, on the basis of uh, the existing uh, uh, TCP IP protocol, you can go further and then, you know, have a number of networks. So the internet was from the very early day a network of networks. And each network, you know, uh, uh, you know can be managed in a certain way uh, uh, differently, but uh, the, uh, the, the, uh, as long as it is based on the, on the open protocols. And the interoperability, you know, is, is, is a very key issue. And uh, when Alain said, you know, that we have the IP version 4 and IP version 6 problem and need 30 years, you know, one of the uh, uh, problems is that uh, it's not backward interoperable. So if uh, there would be interoperability between IP version 4 and IP version 6, probably we would have already now a full IP version 6 based, uh, based system. So uh, let me come uh, with a, a very short comment on the procedural issue. And I think this was also part of the uh, political debate uh, because the question is who drafts the internet protocols? Is it done by governments or is it done in the, in the, in the multi-stakeholder environment? And I think this was also uh, partly one of the uh, problems which uh, uh, stimulated the political debate because the ITU is good, it's an accepted standard setting body, uh, the ITU team, uh, but it's an intergovernmental body. While I think the internet and the whole development of internet protocols came out you know, from multi-stakeholder discussion in a different way. So it's a bottom up way. So that means if you bring internet standards into an intergovernmental body, the risk is very high that you politicize the debate and you have immediately geostrategic strategic or ideological or cultural differences as, as part of the debate. So, and, and it means to leave it in the existing uh, standardization uh, organizations, uh, make it the, the ITF, we have the World Wide Web Consortium, uh, we have the IEEE, uh, we have standardization organizations for uh, um, mobile communication and for, so that means while there is a different nature between an intergovernmental standardization body, you know, which is good for a, a number of things, like for telephony, probably it's good if you have standards for telephony, telephony uh, 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 drafted by the ITU, because, you know, this is a really governmental affair. Every country has a telecommunication law. And in so far, you know, to have standards for uh, the telephone via the ITU, it's, it's a good thing. By the internet, it's a different beast, and I think this is uh, was part of the problem where we uh, triggered a political debate. And um, I think this would be a big mistake if this neutral resources. I think the uh, Jörn Marby from 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 ICANN has introduced the language technical internet governance and uh, protocols, uh, domain names, IP addresses. All these are neutral resources. So it's like air, and you cannot say it's the Chinese air, it's the American air. So it's air. So and if you start to uh, uh, politicize these neutral resources, uh, what we have called in the Commission the public core of the internet, then this will be dangerous for all sides. And in so far, I think from a European perspective, I, I, I did see that it was a very wise uh, uh, move that in the uh, NIS uh, two directive. Now they have this exception clause for the uh, root server operators, which should not be under uh, European legislation. I think this is the only way forward. And we would expect also such exception clauses, you know, from other governments in other cases. So that means if you bring all the political conflicts uh, into this uh, technical debate, then this will be uh, a big disaster uh, for for the, for the five billion people who are using the internet today. Thank you, and, and back to you, the journal. Thank you, thank you very much. That is a very clear message. I could wish for no better summary for this panel. Uh, I, I think we have presented a very coherent and clear message. 
on the need to keep it one world, one internet. You could say we're biased. There does seem to be a strong technical and icon link. If you think we're biased, reach out to us. You can put it in the chat or you can just write to us and we are happy to carry that discussion forward. Um, in summary, I would like to first thank the Foreign Ministry for hosting us. Uh, I've helped to set this panel up, but it was the Polish Foreign Ministry who thought that this message was important to kick off the IGF, and that's why we were strategically placed in day zero. So thank you very much for facilitating this. We would not have been able to start the IGF with that message in our modest contribution. Thank you very much for doing that. Uh, on the second uh, point I wanted to raise, I would like to use one word which we not have used in this session yet, which is cyber sovereignty. There are a lot of sessions on cyber sovereignty. To the, later today, Wolfgang and myself will probably be joining the GigaNet Symposium. I will be chairing a panel on digital sovereignty. Please keep this panel in mind whenever someone says cyber sovereignty or worse yet, national cyber sovereignty. We can talk about those political concepts, but let me just uh, sign off today with uh, carrying forward the message of one world, one internet, as that's the only feasible solution. We are perfectly on time, which as a moderator is a joy to my heart. Thank you to the panelists. Again, thank you to the foreign ministry for setting this up. I'm very much looking forward to the IGF. Thank you everyone for joining in Katowice and online. Keep safe everyone, and I will see you across this week. The session, the session is adjourned. Thank you everyone.